Thank you very much, and it's a great pleasure to be here in Edinburgh in a group of geoscientists, because at heart I'm still a geologist. Uh, my credentials, really, for uh, my current credentials for talking to you is that I'm on the board of Saudi Aramco, the Saudi state oil company, which I've been for a dozen years or so. They don't mind the old folk, because uh, their king is pretty old. Uh, the, uh, and on the advisory board of an uh, extremely creative Chinese renewable energy company, which went from nothing to the second largest uh, wind turbine manufacturer in China in a dozen years or so. It also has a battery business. And its creator, a man called Zhang Lei, a person in his late 30s, uh, dreams of an electrical world. Uh, and he's quite persuasive. He calls it Entopia. He used to jokingly call me a representative of the dinosaurs till I pointed out to him that the dinosaurs still controlled 85% of the world's energy. So he now calls me a representative of the elephants because he's come to see that actually the oil majors with skills and uh, cash flow have a capacity to contribute enormously to this uh, change. I have to admit that even as a geoscientist, I sometimes find it uh, difficult from separating the impact and policies from an organization and a, a, an energy company as a whole to the specific impacts on uh, geoscientists. And the two are, of course, often interrelated. Uh, the transition is necessary and it's inevitable. But we should remember that we've always had transitions. In the 60s, to me and many of my colleagues, it was axiomatic that we would never produce all the coal that, that uh, burn all the coal that was in, in the ground because hydrocarbons were cleaner and easier. And the same will happen with electrification, hydrogen, uh, etc. I once asked way back in the 90s, uh, the Saudi energy minister, a man called, a great man called Ali Naimi, uh, what he thought of renewable energy. And he said, uh, renewable energy is technology and technology will do what it always does is transform the world. Don't worry about it, relax. Uh, he, he also pointed out that in Saudi Arabia, we have more sun than everyone else as well. Some places are lucky. Uh, over the past couple of years in fora with energy people, I or others have asked two questions, one of which was asked uh, this morning uh, in relation to the Paris aspiration of uh, one and a half degrees or well under uh, two degrees. The first was, do you believe it's technically possible? Do we have the technology now, not future technology, the technology now uh, to achieve it? And secondly, will we achieve it? And the answer to the first question is normally 80% yes. And the answer to the second question, as you saw this morning, is normally about 80% no. Uh, so what are the reasons for the doubt? Uh, achieving the Paris targets is uh, not uh, the technology. It's that it can't be done by one sector of society or industry. It needs alliances between companies, governments, and uh, civil society. Hydrocarbon producing companies are currently vilified. At the same time, however, it's become fashionable for people to talk, for companies to talk about purpose. Purpose is one of the new buzzwords in, uh, in business. Uh, now, I have actually always believed through a long career in the industry, that we as an industry have a truly noble purpose, which as we've heard earlier, is to supply the world with reliable, adequate, economic, affordable energy without mucking up the environment or trampling on uh, uh, other people's rights and as aspirations. But scientists have been telling us for something like 30 years, at least 30 years, uh, that our energy has a problem. The major combustion problem is impacting our climate. But the purpose remains exactly the same. So it's a question of how we can transform ourselves 
to supply reliable, economically priced uh, energy, just the source will mutate. Or we will have to mitigate the negative effects of both the new and the old. And there are negative eff effects of the new as well. And there's no doubt that the negative image of the industry, as we saw, is reducing the potential pool of geoscientists who are interested in the industry. That's bad news for the industry and something we really have to fight. Uh, but it's actually not such bad news for you as a geoscientist in a market where recruiting is under stress. Uh, the supply is going down, which is a good position to be in if you have the commodity. There are two areas where alliances are necessary. Uh, one proven way of accelerating the change, which we need, is to put a price on carbon, and you, uh, Wood Mac uh, Neil emphasized that. All the major international oil companies, including the Americans, have called for governments to set a price on carbon high enough to force real change. That means well north of, of $50 a tonne. Shell and BP have been advocating it for about 20 years. Uh, I've been banging on for it for, for at least 20 years. It's worked well in some areas, uh, particularly where the proceeds are used to reduce taxes on employment or compensate those who are badly affected by the, the transition. But the progress is slow. I was at a meeting, a, a discussion a bit like this, with someone from Extinction Rebellion on the panel. So I said to him, why do you not support uh, something which is basically a tax on a substance which you hate? I can't see the logic. Why don't you support it? They just will not have anything to do with anything that has carbon in it. They don't care whether it's taxed or not. The answer is to them, we just have to ban it and stop. And that's plainly only possible in places like Orkney, for example, where there are very exciting uh, experiments, which I think are pathfinding on how we could go through renewable energy, generate hydrogen from that, etc. Uh, so, uh, uh, elsewhere, until grid scale storage is possible, gas is the absolute ideal partner to intermittent uh, renewables. A second way that uh, we need progress is actually for, for governments to mandate changes. In other words, not just put a price on carbon, but through regulation mandate changes, whether it's efficiency mandates on, on vehicles or banning certain CO2 emitting processes unless the emissions are captured. So let's look at two aspects of the transition for GM scientists. First of all, those in hydrocarbon related jobs and then those in other jobs uh, also uh, uh, and the demand for geoscientists in uh, alternative energies. Almost uh, any, whatever scenario you look at, including those where demand flattens, uh, peak demand say in the mid 2020s, which is what we saw on those scenarios, uh, I think it's entirely possible that, that demand will peak somewhere in the late 2020s. And, but many thoughtful scenarios then show uh, demand continuing for liquid hydrocarbons uh, at about the current 100 million, maybe a bit more, 105 million barrels a, a day, quite flat for a long time. And with gas, as you saw on the scenarios, still growing. There is, of course, Another scenario which shows uh, that uh, liquid demand will drop by about 20%, maybe to 80 million barrels a day or, or so. But again, with gas uh, still growing. But even when demand is flat, as you showed, as we saw, we will need to add probably something like 5 million barrels a day of production just to replace the decline. On the bottom of those curves, you saw existing production and it inexorably, you know, it declines, natural decline. So at current levels, 100 million barrels a day, 
we're going to need every year 5 million barrels or so of, of new production. And that's quite hard work. And cost is absolutely vital. As I said, I see demand peaking relatively early, but remaining flat, not declining rapidly, remaining flat for many years to come. It's very difficult to predict because essentially you're predicting uh, the difference between two very large numbers. Decline of demand in the OECD and massive growth of demand in the non-OECD. So developing countries demand growth. Overall, particularly in the developing countries, energy growth offset by decline in the uh, uh, so-called developed world. Uh, what's going to happen, I don't know. But as previous speakers have said, our own actions will affect that. If we are seen as the enemy and obstructing things, it'll just get worse. So we have to be positive and enthusiastic about it. Going back to demand, demand growth has been modest, liquid demand growth for many years. Going back, we add about a million barrels a day, one and a half million barrels a day, it creeps up 95, 96, 100 uh, million barrels a day. So the difference between past incremental demand and the future is probably, if demand is flat, it's probably only about a million barrels a year. So the big, the real future demand is from liquid hydrocarbons needed to fill uh, natural decline and the demand for gas. Now, under flat demand scenarios, there's going to be a fight for market share. Oil is a very unusual commodity. So far as I know, it's the only commodity, and I've worked in the mining industry, uh, where the lowest cost producers have restricted their production and allowed the high cost producers to grow theirs for something like 40 years. Some people never learn. The, uh, that, you are probably, some of you will remember that the growth of the North Sea, our bacon was saved. I have to be used cautious about using bacon because I talk a lot in the Middle East. Uh, our bacon was saved. Uh, by OPEC whacking the price up. We had huge cost overruns. The North Sea and the North Slope were developed basically thanks to OPEC price rises. Shale in the US has also benefited from the same price held up by the low cost producers reducing their production. I personally think that when demand flattens or declines, we're going to have a Bun fight for market share. It'll be very difficult for the low cost producers because they have social demands. So uh, it's going to probably be not a, a, a somewhat oversupplied market and downward pressure on price. So in exploration and development, cost will be absolutely essential. But there also has to be a huge emphasis on embedded carbon. Aramco already markets its crude as being the lowest embedded carbon from energy and production and so on uh, exported to China. And there are publications which show if you analyze China's imports, uh, Saudi Arabia's exports to China are the lowest embedded carbon. And, uh, that's going to be important for all of us. We've got to get the energy we use to produce down, and that requires smart geoscientists, not just to find and develop low-cost deposits, like lighter liquids, less heavy oil and gas, uh, but also by replacing own-use energy in production and transportation. And, uh, renewable energy, and green hydrogen. So we have to actively use renewable energy in the production of this vital liquid that, that we produce. And I think by doing that, we can halve probably our own use uh, energy uh, 
derived from fossil fuels. That's the sort of thing I think that we have to do. But uh, increasing recovery factors is also vital to produce it through existing uh, facilities, reducing the impact of having to build new facilities. And that means uh, that also depends on uh, geoscientists more advanced geophysics, better well placement, better completions, and smart wells, and so on. Now, many scenarios, that's just in conventional production. As we saw, most scenarios uh, show significant use of carbon capture and storage. And that, again, needs uh, smart geoscientists, not just in finding suitable storage places, but in ensuring that the CO2 actually stays down there uh, looking at how it reacts with the reservoir and so on. Uh, CO2 is not the same as methane, and it may react with, uh, with gas. And I think there are always also opportunities for considering capture through mineralization. But I emphasize, none of that is going to happen unless governments, or we, in alliance with civil society, get an adequate carbon price. You cannot do carbon capture and storage, unless there's a carbon price uh, to pay for it. Now, if you look at the other side, the need for, for geoscientists to support the growth of renewable energy, I think it's fairly straightforward. There's, of course, ongoing demand for engineering geologists, for dam site selection and construction, and for geothermal. Uh, dam sites will not just be used for classic big, uh, hydro dams, but for many distributed small dams to be used for pump storage. You don't need a huge dam, you just need enough elevation to, uh, to be able to pump the water up and then let it run down again. The wind and solar sector are also relatively resource intensive, with enormous amounts of, of copper and other metals being required for electrification generally, uh, and for E vehicles. And the same is true of battery storage. Uh, not just the demand for lithium, but for other things like cobalt, which is used in, and other metals used in, in batteries. That's going to require ingenuity from uh, geoscientists uh, in uh, finding resources in accessible and stable places. So, in summary, I think the uh, uh, future of interesting and worthwhile work for geoscientists is actually encouraging, although there are clearly downside uh, risks. But unlike the gloomy prognostications for many professions, artificial intelligence and uh, big data are actually, as was pointed out, our allies and they're tools of the geoscientists rather than a threat. You're not going to be replaced by AI. Now, I couldn't close without mentioning the role of hydrogen, not because of its direct uh, implication for geoscientists, but because it's of its continued, uh, its implications for the continued use of, of natural gas. Uh, with the advent of higher percentages of renewable energy, there will be higher, percentage, higher proportions of uh, surplus production, which can't be used and has to be curtailed. That's a polite way of saying it's wasted. I heard last week that curtailed production in China, and I can well imagine it because curtailment rates from my experience are high. Curtailed production in China is enough now to uh, provide the energy for the entire United Kingdom. Now that production can be used to, uh, for the electrolysis of water into, into hydrogen. It's effectively zero cost uh, uh, electricity and can be used to make green hydrogen. The major producer of hydrogen today and the consumer is actually our industry uh, in the refining process. We make take hydrogen and we stick it onto heavy hydrocarbons, lighten it, more hydrogen, lighter fuels. That's the way refining works. Uh, so 
not only could we use uh, hydrogen uh, for our own processes, but it can be progressively introduced into the gas distribution system, which is ubiquitous. So it's extremely short-sighted, and we have to argue against it for governments for, of, for talking, for governments to talk of banning natural gas in domestic heating and potentially destroying a useful and widespread pipeline distribution system, which we may be able to use for hydrogen. You can initially inject small amounts of hydrogen easily into natural gas streams without anybody noticing it. And Bob Dudley, the CEO of uh, BP, made a, this point very forcefully uh, last week. Hydrogen is also a potentially vital fuel for the bits that are difficult to electrify, heavy transport by road, sea, and even air. So if we're going to meet this great transition challenge, we're going to need uh, smart people of all disciplines. And as was said, we have to remember that we ourselves, by our behavior and our approach and our advocacy uh, and our own actions, can contribute as ge geoscientists to the uh, challenge. Uh, my oldest grandson is about, uh, he's 18, he's just going to university. And if he, he's not a geoscientist, but if he was and asked me if he should be joining a major oil or mining company, a major energy company, I should say, I would say yes, but I'd say be picky about which one you choose and think about your role in that transition. Thank you very much.